The post-apocalyptic genre could be one of the most prevalent genres in history regardless of medium. Movies, TV shows, books, and especially video games all have their own version of how the world ends and how society survives. One such vision into the bleak end of humanity was the Stalker series, a set of survival horror games for the PC released towards the end of the 2000s. Developed by Ukrainian devs GSC Game World, the Stalker games were first-person shooters based in a post-nuclear explosion Chernobyl, tasking players to survive against mutants and humans alike. With the quick success of the Stalker series, a handful of developers left GSC Game World to form their own studio. Based in Kiev, Ukraine, Andrew Prokhorov, Olis Sheshkachov, and Alexander Maximchuk formed 4A Games in 2006. With their background in survival horror first-person shooters cemented with their work on Shadows of Chernobyl, the newly formed studio searched for inspiration on their first major project. 4A Games would reach out to the then-rising Russian author Dmitry Klokoski to turn his award-winning novel into a video game of the same name. That game was Metro 2033. Metro 2033 was released in March of 2010 on the Xbox 360 and PC and was met with generally favorable reviews. Despite the reviews though, Metro 2033 never caught on popularity-wise, releasing in a year that gave us titles such as Mass Effect 2, Red Dead Redemption, God of War 3, Fallout New Vegas, Halo Reach, and Super Mario Galaxy 2, among many others. Being a spiritual successor of sorts and given Stalker's niche and cult status, Metro was almost destined to end up in a similar predicament. And while 2033 won't top many's list of the best games of the last decade, that doesn't mean it doesn't deserve praise for where it succeeds. Metro's greatest strength is its unwavering commitment to immersion and how it emanates through all aspects of its design. The entire Metro franchise, 2033 included, dedicates itself to immersing the player as deep as it can in its world and does it through every mechanic it has in its arsenal. I've brought up the term immersion in previous videos, but never fully defined it when it comes to video games. Immersion is the feeling of being utterly entranced in whatever piece of media you're consuming. Being emotionally attached to characters in a movie or TV show, being sucked into a good book, or even losing yourself in a good song or album. In in layman's terms, something is immersive once you stop thinking about how it's just a movie or video game and start feeling a part of its world in one way or another. Metro does this to a tremendous effect, and it's the defining feature of why I recommend it so highly. It all starts with its setting, story, and characters. Being based off a novel definitely helps as the world of Metro is one of the most fascinating depictions of the post-apocalypse in gaming. Metro 2033 takes place 20 or so years after a nuclear war devastated the world. While the end was near, anyone and everyone rushed to the safest places they could find. For many, that was the Metro tunnels under Moscow. Moscow. After the bombs dropped, the survivors lived on in the metro tunnels, trying to reform society any way they could. Metro stations served as makeshift settlements, providing respite for travelers and acting as centralized markets. Dead ideologies such as communism and Nazism started to rise once again as humanity tried to cling to whatever it could to fight off death. This is the setting the player character Artyom finds himself in. Artyom is a citizen of the station exhibition. Life in the metro was quiet for a time, but increased attacks by mutants and the rise of the mysterious Dark Ones has put exhibition at risk. Tasked with getting aid from other stations around the metro, Artyom travels the dark tunnels fending off man and beast alike to hopefully save his friends and family. Artyom's journey takes him through a multitude of locations and sees him traveling with a variety of characters. Metro's narrative works so well because it's built into the fabric of its world and is grounded in a sense of immersion. Artyom's journey takes him through dark tunnels, bustling market stations, dank sewers, and dead cities, and is accompanied by other people who share the same goal as him survival. For example, Artyom needs to get to the station of Polis, a sort of central governing station to request supplies and aid for his home. But to do so, he has to hitch a ride to Riga as a bodyguard for the team that's shuttling supplies from Exhibition. Once there, Artyom meets up with Bourbon, who knows a back way out of Riga as the station is going into lockdown due to the increasing number of mutant attacks. The only way to their next destination is to go above ground as the way forward is blocked by the decaying remains of the metro. Artyom's journey never takes him to the various locations the game has for the sake of variety. It's a natural progression through the game that keeps it believable and engaging. I've used the word linearity before as well in terms of level design and game design, but it's mostly been negative. Metro 2033 is one of the games that is able to use its linearity to its advantage when it comes to gameplay and story. I usually rail against linear design in shooters, most notably Call of Duty or other AAA shooters on the market, but there's a distinct difference between Metro and its competition. For example, Call of Duty games tend to funnel players into linear levels that don't match their visual designs, taking you out of the experience or sometimes into kill zones that'll fail a mission entirely. Pushing players down a corridor that has them aim, shoot, kill, reload, repeat is totally fine, but if the entire 7-8 to eight hour campaign is nothing but aim, shoot, kill, reload, repeat, it gets really tiring really fast. To break up this monotony, Call of Duty tends to railroad its players into lavish and over-the-top set pieces that can be visually spectacular, but offer really nothing in terms of gameplay. This gets extremely noticeable when the advanced movement craze hit Call of Duty, but the level design never accommodated for clambering, wall running, or thrust packs. Essentially, instead of creating 
creating more open spaces for firefights, something akin to Halo, AAA first-person shooters tend to lead players into curated roller coasters of sorts that demand nothing of them, so much so a giant follow circle is permanently plastered on almost every HUD found in these games. Metro, on the other hand, is still a very linear experience, it's much more nuanced and focused on its story and characters in a way that feels purposeful rather than arbitrary. Not to mention the narrative is intertwined with its design. A post-nuclear world with the only remaining population in Metro tunnels can't really exist as an open-world experience. The circumstances of our team's journey feel real, and thus ground his adventure in a much more deeper reality than most first-person shooters in post-apocalyptic games. Not only does this aid in the world building, but also Metro's pace as a whole. Artyom's trek through the tunnels under Moscow are paced beautifully. Characters throughout the game will act as tour guides of sorts, helping Artyom and in turn Artyom helping them to get to their destination alive. Bourbon, Khan, Ullman, or Miller not only aid Artyom in his goal, but also provide perspective on the situation at hand or the world at large. While the majority of these sections result in combat, some set a different tone. There are quieter moments of travel through desolate tunnels as you take in your surroundings or your partner chats about your predicament. Strange sounds. Either the ground is making that noise or the wind. I also heard tales of singing pipes. They say if you listen long enough, you can hear the voices of the dead. What bullshit. Juxtaposing these sections are portions of the game where Artyom is alone, left to fend for himself against what lurks in the shadows. While I enjoy tagging along with a friend through the metro, when Artyom's alone, the magnificent atmosphere is put on full display. 4A Games puts an emphasis on attention to detail, and this can be found in every aspect of Metro 2033 and the series in general. Environmental designs are packed full of detail to either bring a station to life or show off the death and destruction of the outside world. The depressing air of death in the metro tunnels, the sense of hope the stations have, clinging to the last shred of normalcy, you can almost feel the cold chill of the tundra on the surface. People will carry on long, optional conversations that will fill locations with lively exposition and world building. As I was monitoring the radio, I picked up a lot of weird stuff in the beginning too. Siberia was silent, but the others did transmit, including the strategic nuclear subs. The subs kept waiting for orders. Should we hit them? No one could believe Moscow was not there anymore. Naval captains wept like kids on the air. The crewmen were begging me to check if their families were among the survivors. But I couldn't do anything. Metro's dedication to its immersion doesn't stop at interesting characters or dense environments, but also to its movement and gunplay. Controlling Artyom has some weight to it. Players will walk at a brisk pace while moving forward, but any other lateral or backwards movement slows you down. It's nowhere near like tank controls, but it has a similar idea. That means no Doom-style backpedaling as demons bear down on you, although Doom's the last game I'd compare Metro to in terms of gameplay. Combat and exploration are the main mechanics Metro employs, with some great gunplay and scavenging gameplay. Players have access to a decent selection of guns to utilize. Powerful shotguns, erratic SMGs, and tried and true assault rifles round out the traditional weapons players can find or purchase throughout the metro. The more interesting are the pneumatic weapons. These are weapons that are crafted in the metro and rely on a pumping action to arm. I find these weapons to be the most interesting from not only a gameplay perspective, but also a conceptual one. Just like everything, these guns exist to strengthen the connection between the gameplay and the world of metro. You have to prime each weapon before you can fire at its most lethal, and losing track of how much pressure is left in the weapon can be your downfall in a firefight. All weapons, pneumatic ones included, can be upgraded at shops. Scopes, laser sights, extended mags, or silencers can be applied to weapons to increase stats like accuracy or damage. While it's basic, it serves a unique purpose as Metro's combat isn't straightforward and it's important to tailor your loadout and weapons for any combat scenario. Combat is broken up in a few ways. There's a two distinct enemy types players face in the Metro, that being mutants and humans. These two factions sport vastly different playstyles as mutants attack in droves, charging the player and focusing exclusively on melee combat, whereas human encounters break out into firefights. Mutants common a few flavors, but primarily, players will face the Nosalis, grotesque mole-like creatures infesting the metro tunnels, and the bat-like winged demons that rule the skies on the surface. While there are instances of being able to sneak around mutants, these situations are few and far between. Mutants are where most of your ammo will be spent, as it takes a decent amount to bring one down, and when they attack in hordes, it can be overwhelming and tense. On the flip side, human enemies act as you'd expect, and while most of the human resistance is easy to take down, there are a few armored units that can pose a larger threat. Encountering enemy humans also sets up possibilities for stealth. Stealth is a decent part of Metro 2033 as sneaking around enemies can help save on ammo or medkits that are spent fighting. While it's nothing revolutionary, it works well enough to solid snake your way around enemy patrols or take down stragglers and pick off enemies one by one. This is done best when upgrading your weapons with silencers or using one of the many throwable weapons like the throwing knives. The light on RTM's watch indicates whether you're in the light and therefore visible or in the shadows and not. Most human encounters start off with them unaware of your presence, so stealth is very much an option throughout the game and maximizing your stealth 
of effort helps tremendously with resource management in future encounters. But if you're like me and botch almost every stealth encounter, then Guns of Blazing is also an option, or at least a last resort. Be warned though, Metro is no doom, so running and gunning leads to certain death. Hiding behind cover, taking pot shot at enemy positions, or using grenades of the frag and incendiary variety to flush soldiers out of their cover for the kill are the most effective approaches to combat. Metro 2033's combat scenarios throughout the game add to its tremendous pace by utilizing the systems it has in place to set up interesting and varied encounters throughout the game. For example, you explore through lonely tunnels in the metro only to get ambushed by mutants, having to sneak through a Nazi-occupied station filled with soldiers, defending a station from mutant attacks while its civilians flee deeper into the tunnels, or fight through enemy resistance on the surface as demons circle above. Similar to most survival horror post-apocalyptic games, Metro is laser-focused on resource management. One of Metro's neatest game mechanics is how its economy works. In the Metro, bullets are currency, which is not only a cute metaphor, but also a fantastically interesting way of dealing with buying supplies, ammo, or upgrades. There are two types of bullets, dirty rounds that are crafted in the Metro and in military rounds that were produced before the end of the world. Dirty rounds are far more common and due to the way they were manufactured, do less damage and aren't worth much in the marketplace. Military rounds are what players use to purchase anything in the game's economy. Med kits, filters for your gas mask, ammo, or upgrades for weapons all require military rounds to purchase. The kicker is that military rounds can also be used in combat, upping the damage you can do or being a lifesaver in a pinch. This small give and take system is an incredibly effective mechanic used to force players to make difficult decisions. More than a few times I found myself low on ammo and weighing my options of either saving the military bullets to stock up later down the road or switching over to them to fend off whatever might be in my way. It's one of the best mechanics Metro has to add to the survival aspect the game exudes. This is compounded by the myriad of other mechanics Metro has to not only make it unique among its contemporaries but also make for some great survival gameplay. Typically, flashlights in video games are static objects that just exist constantly within the game world, but in Metro, flashlights run off a battery that has to be constantly charged. This is done by using the pneumatic pump similar to the previously mentioned weapons. Your flashlight will dim until recharged, and during the heat of battle or exploring the many nooks and crannies of the Metro, it can be something you forget until you find yourself squinting to see into the darkness ahead. Similar to the flashlight, gas masks are also a resource you have to keep track of. Entering hazardous areas in the Metro or braving the frozen tundra of the surface can expose our team to toxic air. This will slowly kill him unless he has a gas mask equipped. Just having the mask doesn't solve your air problem as they require filters to work. Each filter has a set amount of time it'll be good for, and once it goes bad, it's like not having a mask on at all. Being cognizant of your filter's time limit is important by either checking your watch or listening for small audio cues, such as your watch's timer going off signaling the end of a filter or RTM's eventual gasping for air. These filters are a finite resource in and of themselves, so making sure you have enough on hand is key to avoiding asphyxiation. The gas mask itself is also a resource. It's not indestructible, and a few stray bullets or wax from a mutant's claws can damage it, either causing stress on the filters or break entirely. If your mask takes damage, you'll need to find a replacement on some poor soul who has no use for it anymore. These mechanics serve two purposes, aid in the enjoyable resource management side of the gameplay, and add even more layers of immersion. I keep saying this, but it bears repeating. Immersing yourself in Metro's world is key, at least in my opinion, to getting the most out of these games, 2033 included. 4A Games put so much effort into conveying this sense of being in RTM's shoes for his entire journey. Similar to the Far Cry franchise, players are never taken out of the first person perspective for cutscenes or transitional movements like opening doors. There are barely any HUD elements, leaving an unaltered view of the action. If your view behind the gas mask is obscured, you can wipe away the blood or water to see better. Your objective and compass are attached to a notepad RTM carries with him and has to be accessed in real time. Cobwebs that impede your movement have to be burned with a lighter to progress. The mechanics I mentioned earlier, like recharging the flashlight's battery, the whole currency system, RTM's movement, replacing your air filters, the atmosphere in general, practically everything is tailored to immerse yourself in the world of Metro, and I adore it. For that extra layer of immersion, I'd recommend turning the language to Russian and cranking the difficulty up. Значит, теперь зырь сюда. Нам нужно добраться до вентиляционной шахты, которая ведет к Сухаревке. Там мы с тобой попрощаемся. Мой калаш станет твоим, но когда базарились. If what I've described thus far interests you, I'd recommend the Redux collection with both 2033 and Last Light, which is the footage you've been seeing. Bonus points if you pick it up for Switch. It might not play like Call of Duty or Fallout, but it's its own beast entirely. I can definitely understand why it doesn't have as a wide appeal as those titles. Metro is a niche franchise, but luckily it's found enough success to improve and expand on a wonderful first entry. It's an immersive, narrative-driven, linear first-person shooter, and as someone who clearly is not a fan of those adjectives, it won me over. The clear passion for a port into Metro 2033 shows in the final product, and it remains one of my favorite games of the last decade.